right, hello everyone. Um, before we dive in, let's get a quick read of the room. So please raise your hand if you remember a time you started as a staff plus engineer in an area. New company, new role. All right, now keep your hand raised if someone has asked you, what's our technical strategy? Or how do we fix our systems? All right, now if you knew exactly what you were doing the first time somebody asked you this, you can put your hand down. Anyone? All right, so we've got something to talk about. Right, us too. One more question. Who's in the middle of this experience right now, whether it's a new job or some new role? Cool, awesome. All right, thanks everyone. Feel free to put your hands down now. So hello, I'm Joy. I'm Nathan. So as Tanya mentioned, we've been working together for almost eight years at Plaid now. So we've gotten to see the engineering team grow from about 20 to 300, had a lot of challenges and change along the way. We'll talk about some of what we learned as we became responsible for fostering technical excellence at Quality at Plaid and some of how our approach changed over the years. Hint, we might have started out trying to do a lot of generic good stuff and then realized, you know, at some point, maybe that wasn't quite the answer. So I wish we'd gotten Randall's talk a couple years earlier, but better late than never. Um, so some of the things we were kind of iterating on our time there were, right, how do we make technical decisions in engineering? What's falling through the cracks of our systems is when we take on new product areas. What are some of our biggest technical risks? How do senior engineers become effective? And a little bit of spoiler alert, right? Sometimes we succeeded, sometimes we didn't. And that's where all the good stories come from. So all of those decisions that sounded really great at the time, and in retrospect, we wish we had done things differently, right? that's kind of what we're here to talk about. And maybe one little bit of extra context is we did this a couple years into our time at Platt, so we kind of got to tell the story of figuring out how to do the job, but without the extra hard mode of like new company, new people, new business context too. All right, so let's start with some context and basic facts. What is it that only an engineering team can do? Senior and staff plus engineers are often playing many different roles, but the critical role of engineering is to build great systems to support the operation and evolution of every business. This is really the thing that no other function is responsible for, for thinking about. But we like it a lot better in the other direction support the evolution of the business by building great technology. It's better because it's a lot clearer that engineering excellence only matters where it affects change. Ultimately, the work that we do needs to deliver, and that means making the right technical investments really matters. Right for the product, right for safety, reliability, velocity. As the team grew at Plaid, it became harder and harder to identify the right technical investments that we should be making to support our increasingly complex business and we need a clear direction. This is probably a common story for a growing company. This context around us was changing, but our systems and practices were lagging behind. This led to many burning fires, unexpected issues, including on the plane, and we began to move slower than we wanted to, even on basic things. We were lacking vision about how the future of our systems should evolve, and also lacked conviction that our current systems were right, even for the problems we knew were not going away. Cool, so let's talk a bit about what we did to solve this. There's about three iterations, kind of different structures of technical leadership we tried over a few years with various mixes of time commitment, types of projects, kind of org structural support. And then we'll also try to talk a little bit about the surrounding context for what made it work or often what didn't. So in iteration zero, we tried to solve architecture by side project committee. Who here thinks that went really well? So like, you know, we were small enough, it wasn't terrible, but it definitely wasn't great. And more concretely, what we did was we got a couple of the more senior engineers together from different teams to form what we called the back-end council. And these were folks that were embedded in kind of teams day-to-day, -day, met up monthly, kind of a 5% side job for everyone involved. And this was during a time where we had a growing engineering team, right, with increasingly kind of siloed knowledge in areas. So one thing the back-end council did, was effective at was facilitating some cross-team brainstorms on things like developer productivity, logging, some issues we were running into that were starting to cut across the stack. The second piece of context is that at the time we were in kind of my microservices-ish architecture and we were at an inflection point where the count of services was starting to rise more dramatically. 
And the council was able to put together some technical principles around service boundaries, database interaction patterns. At the size and scale, like, it didn't matter too much exactly which option we put, picked, just that we picked some consistent and reasonable choice to reduce the sprawl of implementation variance and make it easier to support from a platform perspective. All right, last one for this iteration. So the third thing that was happening at this time is when we looked at the business and the product, we were seeing a pretty dramatic change in the sources of system complexity. So the original Plaid products that we'd been building up until this point had a lot of their technical complexity in how we integrated with banking infrastructure. And that's where we'd spent a lot of time domain modeling our systems, our interfaces, and their behavior. So we had pretty well paved paths around bank integrations, how to add more data, et cetera. But the problem is we were starting to build more and more products that sat at a higher layer, needed to link into those, and it wasn't clear how those products should interact with the core systems. So those original systems were coupled to our original products, weren't really built to be generic components from the beginning, and we started seeing a new products resulting in an increasing tangle. So tangled, in fact, that it got its own brand name internally, which we called the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> Um, and one of the, I think, the fun parts about kind of being here at this conference, is listening to all the talks, is getting to hear how different folks have kind of untangled their versions of this. So we called it the Bermuda Triangle because it was so easy to get lost in the code. And we could probably give an entire talk about our Bermuda Triangle problem and what we did to solve that, but we'll save that for, for office hours. Um, so what happened? Well, we really felt like we reached a breaking point. We were making so many locally optimal decisions, so we were talking about it. We complained about it a lot, and eventually someone listened. Um, in reality, a lot of time was spent on advocacy and getting buy-in that we were lagging behind. We needed to make systemic change. So our VP of engineering created a new rule where a few engineers would have dedicated time to look across engineering. Basically, our first version of staff or principal engineers. This is where Will Kiefer, who cannot be here today, Joy, and myself came in to fill this architecture lead role. Despite the name, the role wasn't solely focused on architecture, and we were not architects, which is admittedly still confusing, but the role name was more about signaling that we had specific focus areas and goals and were empowered to make changes. We were given wide authority to start to uplevel our systems, our culture, our processes in terms of making day-to-day -day decisions, but also we want to be more proactive and have a better technical strategy to guide longer-term thinking. We were empowered. But there was also not a ton of guardrails or outside opinions on what we should do or how we should do it. It was me, Joy, and Will steering the ship. And we were not sure where to start. So we did a lot of research. We talked with peers at different companies to try to figure out what sorts of support structures we could put in place to help us achieve our objectives. And we decided we wanted to take the good things about the backend council, but scale it out to cover more of engineering. So what did we do? Well, we started by dividing up the stack into thirds in terms of focus areas. And we also created an architecture council to help us scale out technical quality. Architecture council members were selected from representative parts of engineering and were tasked with identifying hidden pain points and architectural solutions within the systems they owned. It sounded great, but it was not quite as easy as we had hoped. Let's come back to the last piece of context we left with in the previous iteration. The sources of complexity in our business were shifting. In this iteration with the architecture council, we had a lot more time and autonomy to dive deep and pick problems and identify new opportunities. This combined with more explicit support and partnership with management made it so much easier to ship some larger projects over the finish line. This made, meant we were able to kick off a, couple, a few system re-architectures, including beginning to remove some of the legs of our old friend, the Bermuda Triangle. The second piece of context worth noting is that Plaid changed from a centralized org into a more decentralized one. We had different engineering sub-orgs supporting different business units, and this was by design. We wanted those folks to be able to focus. The side effect was that collaboration and coordination was less natural. In our roles, we correctly identified that we were missing end processes that would enable us to make cross-cutting technical decisions and identify opportunities for engineering leverage. So a lot of cultural and practical improvement was made due to the attention we were paying to these things. But we tried to ship some solutions to this that ended up being rather hit or miss. A repeated issue was that we sometimes tried to emulate larger orgs who seemed to have everything already figured out somehow, and we ended up shipping these things that did not address the Plaid-specific problem. When you look at these mature engineering orgs, it's so easy to point out the types of structures or artifacts that those, they, they, they produce. Technical principles, review processes, strategies, architecture decision records, 
Trying to naively copy these things at your company is extremely ineffective. Unfortunately, it's not so simple. The goal of all these processes and programs and strategy is to lower the activation energy for good things to happen. For example, the process can tell us to refer back to principles or to short-circuit decision-making, but it can't tell us if we're doing the right things or if our principles themselves are correct in the first place. We have to rely on people and culture for that. With this in mind, our problem statement later shifted towards how we can enable people in the organization to be more effective rather than how we can uplevel the processes themselves. The last piece of context is that we were the first ICs at Plaid who were not reporting into line teams. So there really wasn't a template to follow for this role and how to best be effective with cross-team scope as senior engineers. In fact, one of the first things that we got asked to do was write a job description of what we were supposed to be doing. And this came up more than once. <laughs> we didn't yet know how to align the time that we spent with broader org priorities. So often we ended up trying to gap fill for missing teams. And to be clear, this wasn't the useful uh, type of glue work. It's this degenerate form of glue work that consumes your entire job without supporting the things that you actually care about. Joy somehow ended up spending six months as our data governance PM, and Will was often, often pu pulled into random mobile fires on the mobile team. As a result, we were stretched really thin and spent a lot of time plugging holes in the ship instead of building a new rudder like we were supposed to be doing. Even worse, we spent a bunch of time scaling our cluelessness. If you remember our council, we really tried to focus on creating this bombs up, eng culture where long-term thinking bubbled up organically. I think we had more than 20 engineers involved in the council at some point, which is just so many people to coordinate on these questions. We were really ambitious. We hoped this would lead to more teams prioritizing tech debt, but we created the program and processes before we had great examples or guidelines on how to do things well. And the prioritization of projects, many of which were cross-cutting, occurred out of band of team prog planning, which did not work at all. This resulted in a lot of half-baked efforts in a long list of projects that were not, we were not actually able to prioritize and ship. Okay, so now this brings us to the last two years. Hopefully we learned a few things from the earlier experience, and we ended up creating what we called a new senior IC program. So this is kind of similar to what probably like a staff edge community that exists at various companies. So this is about 10 to 15 ICs from across the company, kind of similar to what um, Dan and Shauna were saying yesterday about the size of the navigators group. I think this was also about the size of group we found, it was small enough to gel to be effective, but large enough to give you some reasonable coverage of different things going on. So right back to our kind of a previous problem, unclear how to spend time. But this time around, we got better at defining problem statements that actually align with business priorities. So for example, I spent about a year or two working to improve our reliability. Nathan's been focusing on a strategic new product build. Some of these problems were fairly obvious because of various kind of product initiatives or new features, and we were kind of handed them to the group. Others we identified and surfaced directly, and more came out of group brainstorms. So for example, we had an on-site at the end of last year, called out a part of our stack that needed, kind of accumulated too much complexity over time, right? Maybe it was trending towards Bermuda Triangle land yet again, needed a more substantial revamp, and got support for dedicated prototyping. Right, we're still at this point in time, work, we're working in a decentralized end organization with fairly independent business units. Right, but this time around, we would kind of learned our lesson. So we had a lot, kind of, we still shipped a few processes, but this time much more lighter weight targeted to improve technical decision making. And we'll share some more specifics in a bit. And then the last thing is, at this point in time, right, senior ICs are scattered even more across the org, working on very dis different business problems or layers of the stack. And so now you have members of the group with entirely non-overlapping areas of knowledge. And so a lot of the programming we've done for this group, on-sites, brainstorms, et cetera, is working to bridge this lack of shared knowledge so that you can make better decisions when it starts cutting across different areas. So what did we learn from all of this? What's the version of the advice we would give ourselves in 2020? Other than the need to, to, to stock up on toilet paper in January. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, it depends. Talk's over, okay, just kidding. Uh, what works is really gonna vary by company and the context that surrounds you and the issues you're facing. But we wanna walk through some of the common themes that we have seen work for us. So here's a rough framework for our approach increasing the technical quality of an engineering org. First, pick a problem statement and lead by example. 
Next, enable those around you to make better decisions. Third, build a community to help share context across the company. And fourth, scale what you have to function for the long term by aligning org and technical priorities. One way to think about this is that you have to work to influence what excellence means at every locality, from the things you can personally action to the decisions that the broader team makes, and also set things up such that the right opportunities we identify are prioritized in a more global context. All right, so let's walk through these. So step one, lead by example. It's really tempting to try to solve things at a broad level, right? That's kind of the story we just told when we first got into this role. We were trying to emphasize bottoms up tech excellence culture. And we spend a lot of time trying to encourage teams to protect time on quality, abstractions, reliability, all our favorite buzzwords before it became clear what that meant in practice. And this didn't really work well, well in practice for us, right? We were trying to follow all that advice to delegate, to scale ourselves, right? The problem is we were still figuring out what we were doing, right? We didn't know the answers yet. And so Nathan said, what Nathan said earlier is like scaling ourselves really just meant scaling cluelessness at that point. And so in retrospect, right, we should have been spending more time figuring out some of these technical questions, right, that were popping up, right? Those new areas of system complexity, those kind of Bermuda triangles. So when we say lead by example, right, what we mean is like focus on a problem statement where you can add real leverage. You know, do a tour as a cruise ship director before you try to orchestrate a cruise fleet. And your context about the business and systems is how you figure out a reasonable problem statement to get started with. So two good ways to find a thread to start tugging on. So first of all, right, sometimes there's the system. It's just too complicated. Every time a project touches it, it slows down, right, and then you see it show up in the project retro at the end. So go in bed with a couple of those projects, then take a step back, look at what you've learned, and synthesize the diagnosis. All right, or version two is sometimes you have key business project problems that need to be tackled in a fairly cross-cutting way. Right, so think things like reliability, cost reduction, right, latency and performance optimization, and you need someone looking more broadly at the stack, figuring out a technical diagnosis and how to make progress. And either of these kind of gives you a place to get started in a way that's grounded in business priorities and where you can start by adding leverage directly. Okay, second up. Better big decisions. They're probably important and broad technical decisions, big decisions that are not getting made. Big decisions are really useful because they're big. And big decisions have ramifications on a lot of different surfaces. If we don't have big decisions, then our smaller decisions are worse because they're not pointing in the same direction. Without having some process to align small decisions with big decisions, our systems tend to accumulate a lot of incidental complexity over time, and we end up in many local minima. For example, this can result in different teams choosing different technologies for the same use case or inconsistent interfaces on the same system, which makes things difficult to reason about. That's basically what was going on with Bermuda. And we can do better. So what to do? We have to diagnose why these big decisions are not getting made. The reasons probably depend upon a lot in your company, but a few possible root causes here. The first possibility is that we may not know how to make big decisions at all. Either we spend too much time bike shedding on alternatives, or maybe folks aren't feeling confident enough to advocate for any idea. The result is that it's really unclear when we should commit to a decision. There are many instances at Plaid where engineers were having a hard time arbitrating technical decisions that bound many teams to a specific solution, such as our contentious decision to move to a monorepo. Because we tended towards a conflict avoidant end culture, this resulted in engineers kind of avoiding making a decision at all or things, things somehow stalling. So we created a standardized RFC process to have an explicit contract around when big decisions have gotten enough feedback to move forward and be enforceable. A second possibility here is that big decisions are theoretically getting made, but not enough people know about them. And as a result, they're not enforced. So the decisions kind of get ignored in practice. Our diagnosis here was that we were missing some forum for teams to share out decisions that they were making. And as a result, Na smaller decisions nat naturally start to desynchronize, and folks were not getting enough signal on where other people are going. So we created a technical design review so that engineers could learn from the decisions in others' projects. We have a weekly end review. Folks can bring projects early in the life cycle and raise some of the most important questions and get feedback from the larger eng team. The last possibility is that we're just making the wrong or just bad decisions, and people are kind of aware these decisions don't make sense, so they're correctly ignoring them. 
One thing we noticed was that key questions on, on technical design requirements were getting buried in really long docs. And this led to a lot of wasted energy trying to design the wrong thing on, on a couple of occasions. So when we saw that these questions were getting buried, we updated the spec template to push authors to call out the key decisions and questions in the design. This new template encouraged folks to identify these big decisions in terms of requirements before digging too far into implementation details. And as a team, we got a lot better at this over the years, and people kind of got in the habit of only discussing this section of the spec template at the end review that we created earlier, and that, this is a really good outcome. Overall, our, improve, our framework for improving decisions boils down to diagnose why they aren't happening and work to address the root causes. Standardization and clear contracts for decisions is likely a common useful thing as it helps the team adopt a standardized decision framework, but it's also likely that teams may benefit from more time socializing their ideas and getting feedback. It's incredibly hard to over-communicate about these things. All right, so we just talked a bunch about making better decisions. Now let's talk about how to find some of those decisions. So what you'll probably find is that there's engineers across the company that have the energy to create change, but they aren't talking to each other enough. And now you just have a bunch of frustrated people, right, with a bunch of problems that feel very obvious to them and that aren't bubbling up. And this is resulting in missed opportunities to tackle those pain points. Right, you've got the energy to ch opportunity to channel this energy in action by getting people together. That can be an on-site, a brainstorm. The format doesn't matter too much. And this is probably the area, like across all those iterations we tried and described earlier, we never regretted spending the time building community. I think the key thing which does matter is curating the important topics to talk about, right? Like your knowledge of the company is what makes you effective at doing this. So that could be things that are worrying to you, right? But that aren't being talked about enough. That could be patterns that are popping up repeatedly, right? Shared themes across conversations with different engineers, repeated problem statements. But picking those kind of right topics is what helps build momentum in this group and then surfaces those lurking big decisions so that we can actually make them. All right, so you're operating effectively, engineers are talking to one another, the org around you are making better technical decisions. A lot of good things are happening and we kind of feel good about ourselves for once. But you're still noticing there are some important problem statements slipping through the cracks and it doesn't seem like anyone else besides you seems to care about them. When push comes to shove, every company has its own way of prioritizing debt cr tech debt creation versus tech debt reduction. And we've had our own success and failure stories here as we've attempted to influence this. In our experience, there's usually one of two patterns which are preventing resourcing by decision makers. In pattern one, we like to call it the hidden problem. It's something that's hurting a lot of people and it's only obvious when you look at everything in aggregate and otherwise it's not clear for any one person to identify that there's an issue. This happens most frequently when the problem spans org boundaries. For example, we noticed that a bunch of teams had developed a pattern of using our feature flags database, our feature flag system as a database for our user level configuration. And this worked and was very convenient, but it also led to a ton of incidental complexity as we lack the ability to easily enumerate all the different treatments that users can be exposed to, making it incredibly difficult to test all the permutations of behavior. In these cases, writing down the problem statement, success criteria, and expertise needed to help solve it really unstick progress. Pattern two, the problem is clear, but we don't know enough about the solution space. The solution itself is mysterious. This often happens when the domain is incredibly complex and there's no compelling vision that we want to invest in to manage that complexity. Here we have two solutions that we have seen work well, prototyping and developing a North Star. So we had a core system that was very old, complicated, and expensive to run. However, we weren't sure if it was worth the cost of a rewrite. Having a senior engineer spend a few months prototyping and load testing a rewrite gave us the conviction that full migration was worth it. Having a working prototype demystify the solution. Second example, having Northstar really helped us um, with our Bermuda Triangle problem. We had gotten past the point where we were just confused and reached a stage where we were actively experiencing reliability and velocity issues. After we developed a compelling Northstar for what we wanted to do to unravel things, we were able to prioritize some bigger investments. Having a technical vision in Northstar Helped, make, helped us make incremental investments. So generating clear problem statements and demystifying possible solutions are both ways that senior engineers can uniquely add leverage as input to planning. And while there's no planning process that's perfect, it's very difficult to plan and prioritize something when either the problem or the solution space is unclear. You have to have a plan, and you have to, be, have to believe that, we'll really, that the work really matters. That's not just about 
how the outcomes might, might make your own life better, but it's a lot more about how the outcomes will influence the things that other people care about. All right, now that we've gone through the four steps of the framework, right, let's come back to talking about scaling since we very intentionally skipped that when we started with step one. Right, once we get end, that actually provides the problem statements for new folks to lead by example right, and tackle. So we kind of get to draw in that last arrow of the flywheel, and that's where we can start to see technical leadership scale over time, because now we're able to tackle more initiatives than we were able to do directly just at first. All right, so to recap, kind of here's um, the summary of what we've shared today, right? In the broad level, in terms of what, right? Start by leading by example, then figure out how to make better tech big decisions, build community to identify those decisions, and then align org priorities to be able to tackle them, right? But all of this is the what, and then the how is very much influenced by the context of your business, your culture, product, technology. And don't scale cluelessness, right? Scale after you've kind of figured out a strong point of view on what success and failure looks like in your position. All right, everyone, that's our talk. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we'll be at the office hours later if you want to come talk to us. Yeah.